Um, just three recollections of that process four years ago, the 2011 committee. It was quite a fascinating mini-democracy. And lots of ideas swirled. And um, what was quite interesting is that I would talk about government X has done this, government Y has done that. The UN Convention is interpreted this way and that way and the other way. And then our colleague from Germany, Meindert Havemann, says, ah, and the evidence is that people who actually are inserted in the community flourish, provided these conditions are actually adhered to. And I'll never forget one of the things he said was that the evidence conclusively proves that the best form of protection for people with disabilities is friendship. <laughs> to actually extend the social connections that people with disabilities have is quite remarkable. The other thing I remember from it is that we had all sorts of arcane debates about if we are to have some sort of congregated settings, what's the upper limit? What's the upper number? And I, for the life of me, I can't remember on what we fixed on, but one of the elements that we brought into the equation was not so much it from the inside, but from the outside. In other words, what would other people react? How would they react to a congregated setting of people with disabilities? And the plain truth is that the man or the woman on the street reacts negatively when they see groups of people with disabilities because they only see the mask of the disability. They never peer behind the mask to see the person. So that was one of the arguments we made to keep that number, if there was to be a number as low as possible, although frankly I just can't remember exactly what the number was we settled on. The number settled on by the Irish government, I don't say it's implemented because there, there are challenges implementing it, is that if there is to be a congregated setting, no more than four people, and of those four people, no more than two with disabilities, and those other two should not be carers, they should primarily be friends who are staying with them, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and the last thing that was very important in the 2011 report, although it fixated and focused on community living, um, we did very explicitly draw a link between community living and reform of legal capacity because you're not going to be able to successfully navigate the community unless you can do it on your terms. And that means, more often than not, supported decision-making. Well, now we're in for another real treat, because um, <coughs> you would imagine that there's a lot of obstacles to transitioning in the direction of community living. And you might imagine that one of those obstacles is service providers. Um, and you might say, see that they have a vested interest in all sorts of very traditional, outdated, segregated institutions. And I'm really, really proud to say that's not true at European level. Uh, we brought some officials from the government here to the European institutions last year, and I think it's fair to say you're thoroughly impressed with the European Association of Service Providers, which, the way I look at it, you're in the business of changing business models for service providers to make this dream of community living a reality. So over to you, Luc Selderlou, who is the Chief Executive of the European Association of Service Providers. Good morning, everybody. I prepared this sort of a presentation, and I hope that there is this little device to uh, control uh, the presentation. Uh, Support providers, representatives of organizations of persons with a disability, and of course also representatives of parents' uh, associations. Good morning. And with my presentation, I hope to contribute to uh, this debate. And let me start with uh, sharing some good news. You are not alone. This debate is on the agenda, not only across Europe, across the Americas, also in Japan and on other continents, we are having uh, this debate. What I will try to do during my presentation is sharing what we are doing uh, on these issues um, in, in Europe now, across Europe. So I will first say a few words about my association, ESPD, 
and maybe starting with introducing myself. I am, uh, as Gerard said, uh, Luc Zeldro. I'm from Belgium. My mother tongue is Flemish. My English is a bit on Oxfordish. Sorry for that. I hope that uh, you will understand what I uh, try uh, to say. Before working at the European level, I was director of a daycare center for severely disabled uh, children in Flanders, and afterwards I managed a network of uh, organizations for uh, children and adults with intellectual disabilities. So I have a sort of a history in this, uh, in this, uh, in this field. ESPD is the European network, and we represent today uh, around 11,000 organizations active across the European continent and across disability. Um, 11,000 organizations, all struggling with the same issues, and I will come back to that uh, uh, later on. Um, I'm also uh, co-chair of the European Expert Group on Deinstitutionalization and the development of community-based support services. And in that expert group, we have a very interesting platform of all stakeholders. We do not only have service providers in that European expert group, which is financed by the European institutions, by the European Commission. We also have organizations of persons with disabilities, organizations representing children, organizations representing uh, the, the seniors in society, because this is an issue for, for them as well, and we have uh, some foundations and uh, UN bodies in the European Expert Group on the institutionalization. Overarching objective of ESPD, my organization, is the correct implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with a Disability. Looking at it from a service provider's perspective, which means we mainly work on the correct implementation of Article 19, independent living, living in the community, inclusive education, and uh, labor market participation. These are the three key articles uh, we work on. And of course, Article 12, as said by uh, Gerard, um, legal capacity is a very important uh, building block of all uh, this. The organization works along three pillars. We provide our membership with information on what is going on in Brussels and in Strasbourg, the headquarters of the European institutions. Uh, but we also try to inform these headquarters of the European institutions on what is going on at grassroots level, in the field, because that is equally important. Most of the civil servants um, working for the European institutions are committed people. Maybe a bit overpaid, but that's something else. Uh, they are very committed people but they know nothing about social services and they know nothing about um, uh, disability. So we have to feed them with uh, the right information. And we do that in close cooperation with the DPOs, the organizations representing persons with a disability. Second pillar is uh, innovation. I will come back to that. We try to um, implement innovative models, new approaches, and of course we do lobby work we try to represent the sector in a correct uh, way. In my presentation, and Gerard, please tell me when I have five minutes left so that I, okay. Um, in my presentation, I will look at, I, I will try to give you the broader picture of what is going on in Europe. In a first chapter, in a second one, uh, I will try to define what, uh, what an institution is and, and, and what, what we need as reform. In a third chapter, I will look at levers that we can use to facilitate the change, to push uh, the change, and then I will try to draw some conclusions uh, as well. Let's start with the broader picture. If I talk too fast, please slow me down, okay? Good. The broader picture. We live in a society that is changing very, very fast. And of course, for our sector, for us, uh, the most important uh, change is how we as a society, as a sector, as people, look at uh, disability. Um, 10, 20, 30 years ago, quite often, disability was seen as a problem of the individual. Thanks to the UN Convention, we now have a new definition a new approach of disability. Disability is not the problem of the individual, it's, the challenge, it's a challenge for society to remove barriers for equal uh, participation. Um, we move away from this defect approach. 
a person with a disability is defect, we have to repair. That is the old approach. The new approach is based on human rights. Persons with a disability should be empowered, should be supported, should um, be uh, surrounded in such a way that they can enjoy their human rights like everybody else in society. So we move away from exclusion, we move away from a patronizing approach towards inclusion and uh, human rights enjoyment. Second uh, element which is quite important, I think, is the demographic change. I don't know how the situation is here in Israel, but Europe is aging and the family structures are changing as well. The families are fragmenting. So what was done in the traditional way, the family supports um, family members, disabled family members, that is more or less over uh, in Europe. And the aging society means that we also have to look at how we support uh, senior citizens. Let me give you one figure. If we keep on supporting seniors in Flanders, my region, the same way the coming years as we did in the past, we have to open an elderly home with 150 beds, beds, not people, beds, with 150 beds every week for the coming 40 years. Every week for the coming 40 uh, years, we have to open a new elderly home. Everybody immediately understands that this is not a sustainable solution. We have to develop new support systems. Economy is changing as well. We know that Europe is in crisis. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, there is this booming technology field, which is bringing many, many new opportunities and some risks as well. But let's not be too afraid of this uh, technological boom. It can help us to develop empowering services and support systems. <coughs> also part of the broader picture is um, the workforce, the people working in the sector. In Europe, around 8 million professionals, 4 million in direct support, another 4 million in spin-off activities. What we see is that the people working in these uh, services are mainly women, underpaid and overworked. As I said yesterday evening uh, during the very interesting discussion with the friends of Akim, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. If you want quality, we have to invest in the workforce. That is something which is absolutely crucial. And most of these people are trained under the old defect model. So we have to equip people with the right understanding of the issues if we want them to uh, indeed uh, provide different types of services. Deinstitutionalization, the topic of this uh, presentation, uh, but I would like to put it in a broader picture. It's not only about deinstitutionalizing um, cent residential centers. It is also about deinstitutionalizing special schools. And it's also about trying to move away from sheltered employment towards open labor market employment. So in these three very important areas of life, we have to, we try to develop new models. Easy? Of course not. Possible? Yes, if we work together. If we work together, uh, persons with a disability, families, experts, professionals, and of course, uh, authorities. Fourth challenge for the sector is to provide a spectrum of services. If there is only one product on the shelf, of course you buy that one product. So we have to make sure that there is a range of support systems and services available so that people can freely choose and that the service responds to the needs in an adequate, in a cost-effective uh, way. If there is nothing else than an institution. Of course, a desperate family will choose for the institution. Only when we have different types of support services that address the needs in a very, in, in very tailor-made way, uh, we will be able to move away from institutions. Last challenge for the sector, I think, is stakeholder and mainstream <coughs> cooperation. Stakeholder cooperation is about working together with persons with a disability, the families, and the other actors in society. Mainstream cooperation is working together with the maternity hospital, the ordinary school, the employer on the corner of the street, working with other actors in society. For us, looking at things from a European perspective, that we have these five challenges. We live in a changing 
uh, society with another view, a more dynamic view on disability. We have a problem with regard to our workforce. We need to bring the support to the people instead of the people to the support. If my colleagues ask me, what, what is, what is, why is this UN Convention so important for service providers? We just provide support. Well, in the past, we brought the people to the support. Special institutions, special schools, special employment facilities. The challenge for the future is to bring the support to the people in the communities, in the families, there where people live uh, their lives. Um, and that is only possible when we develop a range of support services. Second chapter, what is institutional care? And I'm sure that uh, my colleague uh, Georgette will come back to that uh, later on. What is institutional care? Um, it was defined by this European expert group on the institutionalization <coughs> and the development of community-based support services. Well, community care is about inclusion in the community. It is about full involvement of the service user in the decision-making processes. It is about partnership. It is about flexible uh, support services that are tailor-made and that follow the changing needs of a person. Uh, it is about an individual approach and it is about putting the person uh, at the center of the support services. And what is institutional care? It's on the other side of the slide. <coughs> I will not uh, read it out. If you put community versus institutionalized care, then we see that, and there is, there is a library full of evidence available, then we see that the quality of life, the satisfaction level, that community-based services give is higher than um, the uh, satisfaction uh, given by institutionalized care. It is not more expensive. Community-based support <laughs> services are not more expensive. And if there is time, I will, uh, I will come back to it. And I know that this is a dangerous argument because we're talking about human rights here. It's human right to live in the community. So should we talk about money? Maybe no. But when I talk with the authorities, I have to talk about money as well. Money is important. We have to find the right funding uh, to de develop new systems. What is important is that we need funding to make the transi transition process. Because what I'm uh, advocating for here is not closing institutions without having alternatives available in the community, in society. It is not about dumping people uh, without uh, support. What are the risks? What are the dangers? The group, the European expert group, identified four uh, risks in transition processes. One is trying to repair the old model. Invest more in segregating models to repair it. It seems not to work. Second risk is setting up a parallel system next to the institutions. We have a community-based uh, system. They tried it in the Netherlands, in Holland. Too expensive, not sustainable not the right way to develop systems, I think. Third risk is that you have an institutionalized culture of rigidity in community-based organizations, in small settings. <coughs> it is about self-determination and people that have the steering wheel of their own life in their hands. So we should not bring the institutionalized cult culture into uh, the new models. And then the last, um, the last risk is, as I already said, closing institutions without having alternatives um, uh, available. And that's what they, uh, my colleague from the States uh, will know that, that's what they did in New York. In New York, 48,000 persons with intellectual disabilities were more or less dumped in the streets, and it was sold as the institutionalization. That is not the institutionalization. That is dumping people. Levers to make it happen. Just based on our own experience, the discussions with the expert group and uh, uh, many, many debates I had uh, with colleagues. And I'm sure that you can add to that and that you might have different opinions on some of these, uh, these uh, levers. But first of all, my, uh, my favorite. Uh, I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't resist, Jared. I, I had to put in my frog. Uh, I, I really had to do it. You know the frog phenomenon. You put a frog in a pot with hot water, 
and he jumps out immediately because the frog knows this is dangerous, I will die. If you put the frog in a pot with cold water and you slowly heat the water, the frog stays in, doesn't feel the danger and dies. With regard to the institu institutionalization, there is a similar phenomenon. When you are part of the system, you don't see the risks. You don't see the risks anymore. And that is why quite often very committed parents, persons with a disability themselves, professionals working in the, in the organizations, and the management says we need this type of support. They are part of the system and they don't see the risks anymore. So what is absolutely needed is awareness <laughs> raising. We have to talk with people in society. We have to talk with um, people in the community, with the, the stakeholders, to make clear what the risks are of living in an institution. Institutionalization is physically damaging the uh, uh, abilities of a person, of children. And that is a very important uh, first element we have to work on, uh, awareness rate. Second, very powerful instrument to avoid institutionalization is investing in families. It's investing in the social network around uh, families so that uh, indeed institutionalization can be avoided. And there are three layers of support, I think. It's important for authorities. Quite often um, people um, from the authorities ask about, and, and how should we structure that? Well, for me, the first layer is family support. And sometimes that is not possible. Sometimes, exceptionally, a family is a dangerous place for a person to be, for a child to be. We have to be realistic. Sometimes it is like that. Well, the second layer is foster care. And if foster care is not possible, then we go into uh, small local community-based support uh, services. Third lever is, as I already said, the development of this spectrum of uh, services, good information services. Let's fully use new technology. Technology can be very, uh, very uh, powerful and very uh, empowering. We have to train and create awareness amongst staff in maternity hospitals and in um, um, preschool um, systems to make sure that children are not put on a, a segregating track. We can provide personal assistance in uh, primary schools, in uh, daycare centers, so we can provide support that is avoiding institutionalization. Respite care. There are so many models developed that can help us to uh, prevent institutionalization. Fourth lever is developing uh, partnerships. Developing partnerships is cooperation with Ministry of Health, Education, Social Affairs, Employment, all these actors we have to bring together and we also have to bring together those that provide employment. We discussed it yesterday evening, employers. If you want an inclusive labor market, then we have to work with the, with the employers. If you want to have an inclusive education system, then we have to work with the teachers and with the headmasters. If we want to have an inclusive society to live in, then we have to work with youth organizations, with cultural, cultural organizations, with all these actors in society that, um, that are uh, out there in society. In other words, we have to try to leave our disability bubble, disability silo. We have to reach out and hope that that will lead to a more inclusive uh, community. Fifth powerful instrument is cutting the supply line, not admitting uh, people anymore to uh, institutions. That was done in some countries, uh, and you have to have a monitoring mechanism um, to, 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 to keep track of things. I can give you the example of uh, what happened in, uh, well, let, yeah, let me, call the, let me uh, give you the name of the country, in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, we closed, thanks to close cooperation with authorities, with municipalities, with, with organizations of persons with a disability and parents, we closed an institution. And the children were brought out the institution through the front door. And through the back door, more severely disabled were brought in. We brought it up during discussions and debates, 
and these severely disabled were brought out and, uh, uh, and a, a program started to include the, the more severely disabled uh, from that center. Guess who was brought in through the back door? Seniors. You have to monitor these processes because it is very difficult not to use a building. We, we try to fill these buildings uh, and we have to try to develop a mechanism so that there is no need for uh, filling these uh, buildings. Sixth mechanism, and that uh, makes the circle round, uh, so to say, uh, the sixth uh, mechanism is installing snowball instruments mechanism, mechanisms that pick up weight during uh, the process. One of them is structural involvement of persons with a disability themselves. If we want to change the system, then persons with a disability and their organizations should be represented in the system. Otherwise, it will not change. If we want family support, then the families should be structurally involved in the decision-making processes. That is absolutely needed. And then it starts to, uh, to roll. Second element there, quite important, is identifying perverting effects in not disability-specific legislation. Let me give you an example from my country. Up to 10 years ago, the salary of a manager, <coughs> me, was linked to the size of the institution. The bigger the institution, what happens? You see the mechanism. This is not disability-specific legislation, but it has an institutionalizing effect. In the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, it was impossible to set up a service in the community if this building did not have two fire exits, safety regulation. There is not one apartment, ordinary apartment in Amsterdam with two fire exits. So result of this not disability uh, specific legislation is institutionalization because you have to build something with two fire exits. If you build something with two fire exits, then the law of economy of scale starts to play. You have to depreciate this extra cost. So you put in more people. We have to identify these mechanisms in legislation if we want to promote uh, the institutionalization. New quality systems are uh, needed. Most quality systems look at input. We need quality systems that look at output, result of the service. Uh, reform there is needed. And new funding systems might uh, help us as well. Across Europe, authorities are experimenting with funding systems uh, that, uh, uh, that put things upside down. In most European countries, the funding goes from the authorities to the service provider that then provides support to the people. What is uh, tested now throughout Europe is authorities provide financial resources to the users, to the families, and they buy their support. Of course, you have to control that. Of course, you have to have quality mechanism to steer these things, but it is a shift in the balance of power and a very interesting new challenge for providers. Uh, and it works. It is, it is uh, absolutely uh, possible. Five minutes left. That is more or less perfect. Thank you. Because I need five minutes more. <laughs> Good. At Harvard University, a study was done on how long an audience like you is listening to a speaker like me. <laughs> 12 minutes. <laughs> After 12 minutes, you lose 80% of the audience. So I would like to thank the 20% that uh, was still listening. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Harvard is a top university, so they wanted to know what these 80% were doing that were not listening anymore. <laughs> Half of them are thinking about practicalities. I have to do some shopping on my way home. <laughs> I have to uh, have a good chat with my son. So practicalities. I can assure you, Gerard is a perfect chair. Everything will be done on time, and you will be able to take care of your practicalities. And then the second half of these 80%. Harvard says, not me, Harvard says, 
They have sexual fantasies. <laughs> I can't help you. <laughs>